So I didn't manage to catch this fight live. I only tracked down a good copy of the full fight earlier on today, as you can see here on Daily Motion. So Jay Opataya dominates. I'm going to use the word dominates. Maris Breedis over 12 rounds to capture the IBF World Cruiserweight title. Now, full disclosure, I'd never even heard of Jay Opataya prior to this fight being announced. I heard Sauerland, who is Breedis' promoter, talk a bit about Opataya and you know, a few bits and pieces. But I'd never seen him fight before, never really heard of him before the greatest fight was announced. And so what I saw in the ring was a revelation to me because Jay Opataya was mightily impressive in there. I thought that he had fantastic foot speed and foot movement, very quick hands, excellent distance control, great combination punching. He didn't often let his hands go in more than two shot combinations, but when he did, it was very impressive. I thought his sharp shooting from long range was excellent. He had upper body movement. He was varying the shots from head to body because early on in the fight, Bradis was using his feet and some subtle sway backs, upper body movement to have the upper tire straight left hands down the pipe fall short to the head. So upper tire started shooting him to the body. He was also landing you know, right hands to the body, hooks upstairs, the uppercut, which hurt Maris Breedis. I think it might have been in the fourth or fifth round, clearly hurt him, busted his nose. And as I said at the start, allowed Opataya to dominate Myra Spredis through the first eight rounds of the fight. Now, sometimes when you're watching a fight live, it can appear to be more dramatic than it actually is because on second viewing, it doesn't seem quite so dramatic. And remember, I watched this fight uh, after knowing what the result was. So to me, it wasn't dramatic because I already knew what was going to happen. And as I say, to me, Opataya dominates the first eight rounds. The fight only becomes competitive in the final four rounds, where Myris Bredis actually breaks Opataya's jaw. Although, Opataya's team claim that his jaw was actually broken or fractured on one side in the second round, and that Myris Bredis actually fractured the other side of Opataya's jaw late in the fight. Well, if it was fractured early on, there was no signs of it. Uh, he didn't seem distressed. His breathing didn't seem any different. There wasn't any blood coming out of his mouth. So maybe it was a very small fracture, a hairline fracture or something like that early on in the fight. The significant fracture appeared to occur very late in the fight, maybe around the ninth, 10th round, something like that, maybe later than that. And the classic symptoms of a broken jaw were apparent. Opataya's mouth was hanging open. There was this dark blood coming out of his mouth. That is typical of what you see when someone has a broken jaw. So Maris Breedis managed to rally late because Opataya started slowing down a bit. Now, I often talk about young guys fighting a young man's fight. When you're in there against a veteran like uh, Maris Breedis, and Jay Opataya is 27 years of age, so he is 10 years younger than Maris Breedis. When you're in there fighting an older guy, what you don't want to do is allow him to slow the pace down, is play his game, fight his fight. You don't want to do that because he knows how to negotiate the 12 rounds. He knows how to fiddle his way through a fight, find little moments to rest in the fight, you know, lull you in and hit you with counters. These old veterans know how to do all this stuff, tie you up, all this kind of thing. So what you want to do is use your youth to the full extent to your absolute advantage. When you're a young man, you've got faster feet than when you're an older man. And Jay Pattaya is going to have fast feet regardless, right? Sure, he had fast feet at 20, still got fast feet at 27. Probably when he's 35, his feet will be faster than most cruiserweights, even though probably not as quick as they are now. But use that. Make it a fight where the old man has to try and keep up with you physically, where you're bouncing in and out of range. Excellent range control from Opataya, touching Maris Breedis with a jab, looking for the opportunity for the left hand down the pipe and make it a high volume fight. And it was a pretty high volume fight through the first eight rounds. Where Opataya again, messing with the range, bouncing in and out, 
Bredis ain't going to be able to keep up with that. Bredis has never been a slow-footed fighter, but he's not a particularly fast-footed fighter either. So again, Opataya was taking advantage of that. And for me, this was the most clear and comprehensive defeat that Myris Bredis has suffered. He'd only previously lost to Alexander Usyk, as far as I'm aware. And the Usyk fight was highly competitive. The Usyk fight was genuinely close. This fight wasn't close. I had it exactly the same as two of the judges, 116, 112. And uh, what, what, well, I guess I obviously have to state that this is a much older version of Myris Breedis than the one who Alexander Usyk fought. And if you really want to be extra fair, you could say, well, Myris Breedis, was he really up for this fight as much as he was for the Usyk fight? Had to travel out of Latvia, which he rarely does. He has traveled out of Latvia a few times, but all Myris Breedis' major fights have been in Latvia. He fought Usyk in Latvia. He fought uh, Glavatsky in Latvia. He fought Mike Perez in Latvia. Do you know what I mean? All his major fights tend to be in Latvia where he's comfortable. Whereas for this fight, he had to come out of his comfort zone. Big time difference between Latvia and Australia. So there were lots of things that he had to contend with. But obviously, as a veteran, these things shouldn't bother him that much. You know, his amateur career and his pro career, he's traveled around and he's done things. So it shouldn't bother him that much. And again, I don't want to take anything away from Jay Opataya. I'm just putting all the, you know, the reality of the situation on the table for people who are going to want to say, hey, you didn't mention this, you didn't mention that. Okay, Maris Breedis, maybe not the fighter he was a few years ago, but still a fantastic cruiserweight, still very dangerous. And it was Opataya's brilliance that made him look pedestrian at times. Because not many fighters in the cruiserweight division, if any at this point, since Usyk has moved up, nobody else can move like this. Nobody else I'm aware of. <laughs> With the constant in and out movement. And on top of the excellent boxing skills that Opataya displayed here, he also showed a tremendous chin, yeah, jaw broken, but at no point did he look like he was going to get dropped by uh, Myris Breedis' shots, at least not to me. At no point did he seem completely out of it. He was buzzed a couple times, but there was never a time when I thought, okay, he's on the brink of going down here. So he showed a real good chin, although after having a broken jaw in this fight, will that affect his punch resistance any? I don't know. I guess we'll have to see moving forward. But in this particular contest, he showed a very good set of whiskers. So all in all, very, very impressed by Jay Opataya. Comprehensively defeats Myris Breeders. No issue with the scoring here. I thought the judges had it bang on. And he already is apparently talking about fighting Lawrence O'Colley. His team say they're interested in that unification. Uh, will they really go for that first or will they instead pivot and go for what I deem to be an easier touch in Makabu? I think that that would be the logical business decision, right? Obviously, as a boxing fan, I want to see him go for the Akali fight right away. But from a business perspective, it will probably make more sense because think about it. Jay Opataya is young. He's 27 years of age. So there's no rush for him to go straight for the most dangerous unification, he can take his time and go for an easier unification against Makabu and then come to the negotiating table against Akali with two belts and say, hey, you've got to pay me more. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Now, again, as a boxing fan, I don't want to see that happen. I would rather the Akali fight happen next because I think based upon recent performances or Opatai's performance here, and Akali's recent performances, that's the two best cruiserweights in the world. So I would rather see that next. But, you know, I, I'm not sure what's in the minds of the business people who uh, look after Opataya. Perhaps they'll be thinking about Makabu rather than Akali. Anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments below about Opataya's performance. Were you, like me, blown away, dazzled? Because perhaps, again, like me, you'd never seen Opataya fight before. This guy was a real revelation. I know he fought for a long time in the amateurs and had a good career there and what have you. But as a pro, you scroll down and look at Opataya's record. 
there's really nobody on there. <laughs> so this came kind of out of the blue in terms of there was no uh, previous form against really high level opposition to suggest, as a professional, of course, to suggest that Opatai would be able to dominate Myris Breedis like this. It's one thing pulling off an upset and beating a champion, but to dominate him in this fashion. There was nothing in his career up until, I mean, the, the guy that he fought before Bredis was 7-2-2. Two, and two. And Opataya has fought out of, outside of Australia twice. Once in Mexico, very early on in his career. And once in, what was that? Is that the Samoan flag? I'm not sure what flag that is. It might be the Samoan flag. And I believe he's of Samoan heritage. So other than two fights, all of his contests have been in Australia and this fight itself was in Australia as well. And although you've had some great fighters come out of Australia over the years, as it stands right now, it's not exactly a hotbed of world-class talent. They do have Cambosis, now they've got Opataya, but again, they don't exactly have a hotbed of talent there. So for him to really have nobody on his record, <laughs> do you know what I mean, in terms of the world scene, and then come in and dominate Myris Breedis like that. It's an eye-opener for me. So hats off to Jay Opataya. There is definitely a new star in the cruiserweight division, a very talented fighter, young-ish at 27 years of age. Hopefully he can fully recover from that jaw injury and go from strength to strength. Hopefully we haven't seen the best of him and we're going to see even better performances than this. Now. In terms of a fight against Lawrence Okoli, it's a very different kind of prospect because Lawrence Okoli at six foot five would tower over Jay Opataya. Lawrence Okoli has a longer reach than Opataya, although here it says Opataya's reach is 76 inches, which is a nice wingspan. Uh, but Lawrence Okoli's reach is even longer than that. And as we saw many years ago in the Isaac Chamberlain fight, Akali is able, just with his sheer strength and size, to nullify a guy who is slicker than him, who has better footwork than him, who has faster hands than him. You lay his weight on you and bully you in the clinches and make it awkward for you to get to him at range. That's what he did to Isaac Chamberlain because people looked to Isaac Chamberlain and Lawrence Akali separately and they said, well, Chamberlain's on another level in terms of slickness and coordination and all this kind of stuff, that's what people were saying. They didn't factor in the physicality of Lawrence Sokoli. He's so physically strong and he hits so hard that he can nullify a lot of that stuff in terms of the disadvantages against a guy like a, uh, Isaac Chamberlain. Could it be the same with Opataya? Now, I think Opataya is better than Chamberlain by quite some way. I think he's got faster feet, better footwork, showed a real good chin here, and obviously tremendous confidence to go in there when he doesn't really have the background as a professional to indicate that he's on that kind of level. He clearly believed in himself. He knew inside, I'm on this level and beyond. So tremendous confidence there too. So uh, yeah, I'm saying this guy's better than Chamberlain, but I'm just using Chamberlain as an example of somebody who looked a lot slicker and more precise and what have you than Lawrence Ocoli but was just bulldozed, okay? That fight went the 12 rounds, but Isaac Chamberlain was never really in it. With J.R. Pattaya, surely Loris O'Colley would be looking to do the same thing because he's not going to be able to stand there, as in Loris O'Colley, and go jab for jab and, you know, counter for counter with Oppa. He's not going to be able to do all that. He's not as well coordinated. His feet ain't as fast. He's not going to be able to do that. So he's going to have to impose himself physically. <laughs> Dare I say it, make it an ugly fight. And if there's one thing Lawrence O'Colley knows how to do well, is make a fight ugly if he has to. Sometimes even when he doesn't have to, he can make a fight ugly. Will Jay Opataya be able to cope with all that? Will he be able to maybe evade Lawrence O'Colley's attempts to come in and clinch and whatever and actually back off and throw counters? Because most orthodox fighters do tend to find it a bit more difficult clinching a southpaw than clinching an orthodox, particularly if the southpaw fights side on. If you're up against the southpaw who's very square 
like let's say, I don't know, pick a random name, uh, James Kirtland, a guy who squares up and comes, to, he kind of gives away his southpaw advantage, right? The advantage being the southpaw is used to facing orthodox fighters because most boxers are orthodox. So he's training his whole amateur career and fighting people in the amateurs and in the pros. He knows how to get past the orthodox fighter's lead hand and land his own right jab. But with orthodox fighters, they struggle to land their jabs against southpaws, most of them, because they don't fight that many southpaws or even spar that many. So when you square up, as a southpaw, you're giving away that advantage because now all of a sudden there's an opening there for the orthodox fighter to slot their shots right in between your guard if you've even got a guard up, you see? So with, uh, you know, southpaws, if the guy's actually staying side on, it can be difficult to grab hold of him. It can be difficult to certainly land your jab and you're relying really on a straight right hand. Now, Lawrence O'Colley does have a fantastic straight right hand, <laughs> very powerful, and it's quite fast as well. So J.O. Patai is going to have to watch out for that. I think it's an intriguing fight, and I'll talk more about it if the fight actually gets made. So anyway, long story short, let me know what you guys think in the comments below about Opatai's performance here. How impressed were you? How did you score the fight? Did you, like me, agree with two of the judges, 116, 112? And let me know what you think about the prospect of a unification between Opataya and Lawrence Hakali. How do you see that fight going? Let me know it all. <laughs> let me know all of what I just talked about in the comments below. All right. If you're tired of the biased narratives and mass censorship on mainstream platforms, and you want to be part of a community of critical thinkers who love free speech just as much as you do, then come and join me on Patreon and access my weekly no holds barred censorship-free podcast where we lift the lid on a wide variety of controversial topics. It's not mainstream friendly. It's not politically correct. But that's the whole point. We dare to stand as a beacon of reason against an army of insanity. Just head on over to my Patreon page and select the tier called Hatman Hot Topics. You'll gain access to a minimum of two hours of exclusive content every single week, including podcasts, videos, interviews, live stream Q&As, as well as my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. Not to mention a vast back catalog of hundreds of hours of previous episodes. You can listen via the Patreon app with the option to download in high quality MP3. We've also got an element group where you can come and chat and hang out with myself and other members. Unlike Discord, it has full end-to-end -end encryption, it's decentralized, and it's 100% censorship-free. You can also send voice notes, as well as much larger audio and video files than you can on Discord. So come and sign up on Patreon. There's no contract, there's no commitment, you can cancel at any time, and it's cheaper than a cup of coffee. So I'll see you over there. I'm out.